All righty. So welcome uh, to the last Madison, Wisconsin admin group trailblazer community session of the year. Um, we're excited to welcome Andy um, as a presenter today to talk to us about AI. Um, just real quick housekeeping, we are recording uh, and we'll get that posted. Brian has a YouTube channel, so we'll get that posted and we'll mention that in the um, Trailblazer community as well. I'm Jen Bowen. I am one of your co-hosts along with Brian. Square, I think, is going to be joining a little bit late today. Rachel is also a uh, user group leader on the Milwaukee side of things. As most of you know, we alternate between Madison and Milwaukee um, for sessions. We are always here for uh, learning. I mean, that is part of the reason why we do this is to learn more. There's so much about Salesforce that we can't possibly know it all especially the three releases a year, uh, everybody is kind of reset and at the same page with not knowing a whole lot about those uh, release notes. Uh, speaking of which, if they are not released yet, I know that the uh, spring release is coming um, pretty The quick. one month notification this morning. We always are looking for speakers. So if you have something that you want to share, um, that is exactly why Andy's here today, because he had something he wanted to share. Uh, and uh, you can contact us. We can get you on the schedule. Um, we're happy to learn from you, your mistakes, your achievements, and um, keep learning together. So please reach out. Trailblazer community group friends, we do still have some friends out there in the area. Um, one thing I want to call out is that Sales for Saturday for Madison, we're coming back in person. For those of you that are interested in joining, we're going to get our event bright up and get something scheduled for the first Saturday in January. So myself and EJ, who's on the call, um, are going to start co-hosting a Sales for Saturday in the kind of Madison or greater Madison area. So um, we look forward to um, just getting back together and starting to learn more together on our Saturday mornings. Um, also, there's events with uh, Salesforce. There's some world tour stuff going on. Trailblazer DX uh, registration had just opened up. That is in March sometime, mid-March. If anybody has the date, uh, or you can just click this link that I will post on the Trailblazer community so you can check out any kind of uh, Salesforce -y events that are coming up. Also, there is a community calendar link here, too. So any of the uh, Dreaming events, those types of things be posted out there. We like to take a moment to just open up um, kind of the floor a little bit to see if there are any job opportunities. Um, those usually are spiking this time of the year, um, beginning of the year, any celebrations or anything else anyone wants to mention? Okay, quiet group. That is fine. So with that, I am actually going to hand this back over to Andy to let us know about this thing called AI? Thanks, Jen. Let me get my screen shared here. Get my Zoom windows all moved around because they kind of take over the screen. <clears throat> all right. So assuming you can all see my screen, it says that you can. Um, <laughs> have you all heard about AI yet? Um, and have you heard Salesforce mention it yet? So that's the topic of this presentation. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for participating in the Trailblazer community. As Jen said, your stories make this group successful. Please, please, please contact um, the group leaders to, to participate. It's been very meaningful for me in my career, and I'm sure yours is out as well. So anyway, thank you all for being here. I'm a solution engineer with Salesforce, um, which means I get to understand, learn, and explore all these cool geeky products that we have and share them with you and share them with my customers. So that's what we're doing here today. I've been around Salesforce ecosystem since like 2011, I think. Um, I just got a Facebook notification of, of early December 20, 
2012 was my first Salesforce class. So been a long, long time, I guess. <laughs> so um, as you probably know, you should make your purchasing decisions based on anything, everything that is generally available and not anything that I'm going to tell you today, because almost everything that I'm talking about is future looking. So keep that in mind. And uh, let's talk about AI. Why are we talking about AI? Why is everyone talking about AI? And why is Salesforce so all in talking about AI as well? Well, if you've seen any headlines recently, AI is going to take over the world. It's taking all of our jobs. It's passing these exams from business schools and law schools. And it's stealing people's voices and uh, disrupting the entertainment business. Um, that's why the actors and writers were on, on strike. And it's going to change all of our jobs. Millions will be out of work or quite potentially nobody actually knows how that's going to be affected. What we do know is that AI, of course, is going to change a lot of different things. We're going to work differently and our jobs will probably shift in different ways. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about how that might change um, in just a little bit. Why this has come up is that we've been going through this AI revolution and it started a long time ago where we had these pattern recognitions that we still use today. If you ever had these stupid little Google, Google captures that you have to select the traffic lights or pick, a mo pick all the motorcycles in the picture or find all the bridges and evidently you'll probably get it wrong because the AI is smarter than you are. Um, that's pattern recognition. If you've had early Roomba robots, uh, robot vacuums, those look for patterns to find um, the obstacles in your floor when it's vacuuming. And then we started these speech recognition devices and everyone seemed to get them at once. We had Siri and, and Alexa and we had OK Google and probably all of your homes are now kicking off um, these, these speaking assistants. I was just checking to see if mine alerted. And those are okay, they, they tend to work, but now we're into this generative AI stage. And generative AI, most of us are probably familiar with something called ChatGPT, but generative AI is more than ChatGPT. It actually creates everything from images to music, to video, to text. And it's using large language models to generate that, that output or that content. Today, the rate of change will never be as slow as it is today. So think about that, things are accelerating. And the reason why ChatGPT is in the news is that it literally only took them five days to have 100 million users. That's astronomical. You know, some of these other companies, it took years for them to get there. And so that's the, why this is, this is like so popular and, and why everyone's talking about it. And what's different is that in the past, it took a lot of work to actually use AI. You needed really geeked out data scientists in, in very large organizations with a lot of financial and computing resources to build any kind of AI. And those AI use cases were pretty finite. They were pretty small um, and could only do like things around like process acceptance. But now computing power is readily available everywhere. We carry more computing power in our pocket with our mobile devices than we do, than was used to create, launch, and operate the space shuttle. I mean, it's just crazy. And even more so, if we needed more computing power, it's available via a website. I can go to AWS and get as much computing power as, as I want, um, which means that technology has been democratized. It's, a, it's available to everyone. And now people are aware of it, which means that it can get better and wider adoption. So time for a quiz. Everyone pull out your mobile devices, if you wouldn't mind. And uh, I'm going to have you fill out a couple of quiz questions. So if you can either scan the, the QR code here or go to menti.com and use the code at the top of the screen, I would like to know how many of you have used generative AI. And we'll give you about a, a minute or so here to, <laughs> to answer these questions. Come on, we've got 25 participants online. I want to know for the two people who said that my life is now GPT, did you ask GPT to fill out the survey for you first? <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> I did have a conversation with it, though, on the way back from coffee this morning with the... the <laughs> 
you can like connect to it like with a as, as if it's a phone call and just have a natural conversation. So that that was kind of weird. I did <laughs> I did not know you could do that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so I, we're we're looking at uh, getting a new car. Uh, I'm sorry, a new stereo inside of a car that we just bought. So I was asking it questions like, oh, like what are issues with um, replacing a stereo if it has the uh, OnStar capabilities and here's my make and model and where's a good place to buy it and what are average prices? And it, it was kind of neat. It, it, and I was able to do it all hands-free. So that was neat too. I mean, that's really cool. I mean, I just asked ChatGPT, what should my investment strategy be on basis of a, a certain starting funds and what I want to cash out? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the word generative, by the way, which means create, make up. Oh, mm -hmm. well, I'm not saying I'm following. I wanted to see what it said. It, it's good info, though, for sure. Um, the reason why I wanted to do this survey was to hear how others have been using AI. Uh, EJ, that was great. Um, anyone else want to share what, how they've, they've used AI? I use it to give me a basis to start my research on uh, how my lightning component should be written. Oh, nice. It was 100% wrong, but it gave me the structure <laughs> that I needed to be able to research it. <clears throat> Anyone else? I've used I just it. recently, oh, go, sorry. Go ahead. Um, when I was starting to look for a new job, I used it to like help rewrite my resumes based on the job descriptions. It's pretty awesome. And I have done the Very opposite cool. of that to help me write a job description. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, as well as, you know, making emails and things like that a little bit more concise. Um, I tend to word vomit and I use it to help me kind of uh, consolidate my thoughts a little bit more and be a little bit better with my communication. Cool. Well, if you all stay on this page, uh, on your polling page, we should be able to move to the next slide here. When talking about generative AI, what does GPT mean? We have the galactic parrot translator, generative particle transmorgifier, generative pre-trained transformer, and the grumpy potato tickler. I really like the Thank last you. one. <laughs> By the way, ChatGPT gave me these answers. I'm giving a, a thumbs up for the tra the Calvin and Hobbes reference. <laughs> the transmorgifier. <laughs> well, the correct answer is generative pre-trained transformer, um, which is a mouthful, which is why it's been <clears throat> shortcutted to GPT, of course. And all that really means is that it is a data model that has been pre-trained with a lot a lot, billions and billions of rows of data. And what it means is that when you give it something, it, transform it transforms it and generates something out of it. So of course we call that generative pre-trained transformer. It makes sense, right? Next question, describe how you use AI. Well, we kind of talked about that a little bit, but if you all wouldn't mind throwing some things into our word vomit here, that would be great. Anyone or my not response is not showing up. There we go. <laughs> I like the he is my boyfriend. I mean, that's an interesting uh, thought that you've actually gendered your uh, AI um, <clears throat> and think of it as a person. So writing blogs, let the internet do the thinking for me, Salesforce research, travel planning, Starting point for dev tax, tasks, better email writing, answering this question. <laughs> nice. Uh, for those of you that have only kind of poked around at AI that, that said in the beginning that, that you haven't dabbled much, here's some examples of what people are doing with it. And it, it is really great to, to do these kind of things. Um, how long has Salesforce been working on AI solutions? I know that, that we really started talking about um, Einstein GPT uh, and Genie eight months ago at TDX, um, two years ago, um, 
maybe five or ten. Looks like we got some discrepancies here between five and 10 years. Well, the answer, actual answer is 10 years. Salesforce started working with AI 10 years ago. So since we've been working with, 10, with AI for 10 years, are any of you actually using any of Salesforce's AI solutions in your org? So those are things like sales or service Einstein, lead scoring, opportunity scoring, Einstein bots, next, next best action, article recommendations, uh, Einstein vision, Einstein case classification. Always well, wanted to, but never had enough data to actually make it work well. <clears throat> it's gotten better. You don't need quite as much as you used to, but I agree that that was a lot. It did require a lot of data in the past, especially for lead and opportunity scoring. So there were a couple of people that said, yes, I'm curious if any of them would unmute and, and say what they're using. No? Okay. You can be shy. That's fine. All right. Well, thank you for participating in my survey. So let me go back to my slides here and talk about some of the things that we already talked about. AI has been being used in a lot of different places and we've talked, and it is actually being used in reality very successfully in some of these areas like fraud detection, making sure you are who you say you are. When you contact your bank, they may use some fraud detection to determine who you are. Biometric recognition for sure, especially facial recognition, facial uh, or fingerprint recognition. They think about biometric recognition and how good it's gotten. If you have an iPhone, I assume Google phones do this the same as well. My iPhone recognizes my son from when he was two to when he is now 22. It also recognizes me when I wear glasses, when I don't wear glasses. It recognizes me when I didn't have a beard and did, and I had even more hair at the time. So it's really, really good at some things. We have natural language processing, which uses voice to, to, to data or, um, or even in, in chatbots. And we talked about those sophisticated assistants. As I said, Salesforce has been doing AI for 10 years. We started our AI research in 2014 when we also acquired Relate IQ. If you've ever used Salesforce Inbox, that is, was one of our very first AI products. And since then, we've relaunched we Einstein in 2016. We've created our Office of Ethical Human Use. And kind of the most recent stuff is, is all the Einstein generative content that you're starting to see. Some of the big things that, that are really important to us as an organization, though, is our commitment to trusted AI. We're part of the White House's organization for that. We're on AI ethical councils. Um, and we're writing patents. Um, in the last year, we've written over 100 AI patents, actually. And so we talked, I mentioned some of these and uh, that some of you are already using, but these are the things that, um, that existing Salesforce customers are using for predictive AI type things. Um, we do over 100 billion predictions a month, which means somebody's using these if it's not you. And so you might want to look into what kind of availability you have and how these could help your um, your users, whether that's Einstein bots that are answering doing self-service for your customers, or you're using it to route cases um, to your service agents, or using it to do next best actions where agents can actually take action on behalf of customers. So um, <clears throat> we've talked a little bit about for, uh, both types of AI, and I just want to make sure that everyone understands that we have predictive AI and we have generative AI, and together they actually make something pretty powerful. Predictive AI is what Salesforce has been using for a really long, for these last 10 years, is where we see some marks in your data, some, some of the attributes of your data, and say, because of X and because of Y, you should get outcome Z. Um, as Brian was talking about, if you want to do lead scoring or opportunity scoring, you need a lot of data to see how those leads are, are transformed and, and whether or not they're quality leads. If you only have 10 leads a year, it's really hard to make predictions off of 10 leads. If you have 10,000 leads a year, it gets a lot easier because you can start to see you know, real patterns in that data. Generative AI, and this is where I said, remember that word generative, is generative creates. Based off of things that it has learned, it creates new things. So that 
can be really great, but can also introduce a lot of problems, especially if the data that it's being fed isn't really great either. <laughs> so excuse me, what is generative AI? Well, it's pretty simple. We have what's called a prompt where you ask a question, that question is sent to a large language model, a GPT, um, a grumpy potato tickler, and you get back a response. So I might ask a generative AI, write me a poem about Salesforce. It sends that request into the LLM and we get this response back. In clouds above, Salesforce soars, linking data and opening doors. Lightning fast, trails it paves, guiding business on digital waves. It's beautiful. I couldn't have written something so, so lovely. So what makes it so great? <clears throat> well, I used it for this presentation. The first time I gave this presentation, I had to give this as part of a panel for people who administer motor vehicle departments, their customer service agencies. Yes, all those people do participate in a uh, consortium that helps to improve customer services in DMVs. And I got to talk about how they could use AI to improve customer service. But I didn't know how to start this conversation. So I actually asked ChatGPT. And the smart thing about ChatGPT was not only did it give me five questions for a moderator, it told me why these were important questions too. It thought ahead for me about these questions, which was something I didn't even ask it to do. The other thing I can do with, with it is start thinking about how do I explain complex processes? In this case, this is how you get a real ID from Wisconsin's DMV. Now, if you've ever tried to get your real ID, it's kind of confusing. You have this page on the left with a bunch of sublinks that tells you to go get this or go get that, but it doesn't anywhere tell you actually what the steps are to get this. So I asked ChatGPT, to explain this like a fifth grader would understand. And these were the steps that I got, which are significantly easier to understand. So you can start to use it to explain complex problems. When it comes to Salesforce, we're looking at how do we use your Salesforce data to help self-serve for agents and customers. This is something that's coming that's called generative search answers. And it's gonna use your knowledge articles to answer questions on the fly. It will take those knowledge articles, combine them together, and come out with an actual generated answer to answer that question. And then the great thing is, is that it can provide that there's a feedback loop, so someone can t can determine whether or not this is good or bad, or uh, and it references the articles that were actually used to generate this content as well. And we're going to see more things coming out of this generative AI pieces in Salesforce such as when you start recording phone calls, um, if you're using something like Service Cloud Voice, or maybe you've connected Zoom up to Salesforce, you're going to get transcripts that come out of that. And what we can do is generate follow-up notifications and action items for sales reps right out of that. Meeting hosts, there are maybe a couple people in the waiting room. Yeah, I saw that. And to, and to do all that, <clears throat> um, we have something at Salesforce called Prompt Builder. And again, that prompt is just a way to ask a question of a large language model. And so I'm gonna show you a little bit about how Prompt Builder will work. It's in pilot right now, um, and it's designed to do two different things. One is generate emails, and the other is to fill in fields for you. And I'm gonna show you the email generation part of it. But before we get into that, it's important to understand how do you build a quality prompt? You know, I that first prompt that I sent was, you know, how write me a poem about Salesforce. Gave it nothing other than that. That's not really a quality prompt. So when we're writing a quality prompt, we want to think about who are the participants, what is the setting, what content should be applied, or where is the content being applied? What's the goal? What's our outcome that we would like to have of having this prompt? What data can the prompt use, whether that's accounts or contacts, and what other instructions should it use to generate that content? So here's my user story. As the support manager, I need to prepare my customer with a review of open cases as part of my quarterly business review. I should have added in here, I will send this by email. So let's switch over to Salesforce and let's do that. What does that look like? Well, here I am logged into my homepage in Salesforce. And you're probably all familiar with this. 
Um, I need to con- reach out to my contact, Ms. Lauren Bailey, and I'll send her this email to prep for our quarterly business review. So I click the email button, and what do we have to do? Well, I have to start typing. Hi, my name is Andy. I'm your rep, blah, 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 blah. Here's what we're going to do. Here's the cases. Oh, man, where are the cases anyway? Well, I don't need Lauren's cases. I need her accounts cases. I got to go click over here, click into the account, go to service, wait for those to load. There's more than six cases. I got to view all. Probably got to sort. I already did that so that I could find my open cases. And now I'm just going to copy and paste, right? So just copy and paste these to create create my list. Um, here's the, oh man, that's a link to my internal, internal Salesforce. I don't want to do that. How do I, how do I get rid of that in the email editor here? I don't, maybe I click, no, that's doesn't even have the link. I don't know how to get rid of it. Now I got to type it. Okay. I've probably lost you all and you're bored to death. You're probably over playing with chat GPT still. What if instead I could actually accomplish that user story by clicking a button? And that's what draft with Einstein does. So when I click that, I'm using what's called sales GPT, and it comes with a bunch of standard prompts that you can use to create some very basic templates. But instead, I wanted to create this custom quarterly technical support meeting. And when I click that, it's going to take all that data that I talked about and create an email message for Lauren. Let me go ahead and make this bigger. <clears throat> so here's what we came up with. Um, we've got our recipient, who I am, my title, the company I work for. Um, how long I've been working here, um, and why I'm con- why I'm connecting her company name. Here's the activities that we're going to do. Here's all my support cases. First two cases are about related or billing inquiries. Um, final two cases are being related to charging issues. So you can see that it was able to gather all this content for me, and I could just review it as the human in the loop, make any kind of changes, and then send that off to Lauren. So how did we get here? Well, let's take a look at Prompt Builder. So Prompt Builder, I think, is supposed to go GA um, with the spring release. And I'm going to go to Setup and look for Generative AI in Setup. Very first thing you need to do, turn this on. So that's all that's in the Setup. And then I can go to Prompt Builder. You can see I have no ability to change those stock, those out-of-the-box prompts, but I do have the ability to create this quarterly technical support meeting one. <clears throat> so if you've ever created an email template or a word mail merge, you can probably create a prompt. The great thing is, is when I'm creating this, I have all these variables that get, get put in here, like my sender title or my sender's name. And that all comes from this resource right here. When I click in here, you can see that I can use a flow, can use Apex, And then I have information about my sender, recipient, and organization. Sender is the contact. Recipient is actually the user record. And the organization is stuff from the company information. So that's what it's pulling in to create this prompt. Now, if you remember, if I go back to how to build a quality prompt, we have participants, the setting, the goal, the data, and the instructions. That's what I've got here. We've got my participants myself, who I am, um, who my recipient is, and what we're doing. That setting right here, the quarterly support review. And then I have strict, I said strictly follow my instructions below. And I'm using these, this triple quote to tell Prompt Builder, these are the instructions. First paragraph, introduce me. Second paragraph, a summary of what we're going to do. Uh, by the way, I didn't tell it anything about what happens in a quarterly support review, this is where the generative AI is figuring out what that typically is, what it knows about it, and just threw it into a paragraph, um, which I hope to be true. Um, I didn't give it any instructions about the activities that we actually do here. And then I tell it, tell me how many cases we are, we have, how many open cases there are, and, and what we're doing to resolve these. And now I'm going to use Flow. I'm going to use flow to get all the related cases to my contact. So let's take a look at that flow. Fine, in just a second. 
fourth paragraph, thank them. And this is the outcome, you know, encourage them to respond. So those are all those five elements in building out a prompt. When I look at flow, there's now a new flow type called a prompt template flow. And this is, this is what you use to gather additional data to put into your prompt. I, of course, already have one built for this use case. And this is how I'm getting my cases. Now, there are two, two requirements for your, your um, prompt templates. Um, one is that there can only be one input variable. And that I've named var contact. This is that available for input. If there is more than one, it will not let you save this flow. And you did not see in my prompt template anywhere that I specified the, um, the, the data that is flowing into this flow. So what the, the prompt builder is doing is it's just finding the only available variable and putting in the contact data. So that's what it's doing. The other thing that's new or different about this type of flow is that we have this create prompt instructions element. It's just something new that's that's part of Einstein GPT for creating flows. I'll show you that in just a second. So as we walk through this flow, we're just gonna get cases. Let me close out my toolbox. I'm gonna find the account ID that equals my contacts account ID. And I'm only gonna find my open cases. Status does not equal closed. Like all good admins, I'm not gonna assume that there's cases. So I make a decision here, make sure that my get cases is not null. And then we're gonna go down our happy path. If it, if it didn't find any cases, I'm gonna create a different prompt and give it a different instruction. But we, assuming we're gonna find a bunch of cases, we have to loop through each one of those. And that's all our loop does here. And then we go ahead and use this new element called create prompt instructions. And what this element actually is, is it's an assignment element that is doing an add action. So every time it goes through the loop, it's adding whatever I've put in here as text into this element. So I am saying, again, there's this resource picker and I can use any of the resources that, that are in this flow. In my case, I want to look through every case that I wanted to find you know, the, the subject as an example. So just like building any other flow, I can grab the subject and drop it in here. And I have the description and the status. I've done a little bit of formatting here to try to make this look a little bit like JSON. It's not actually necessary um, and didn't change the outcome, but I was doing a little bit of prompt engineering and trying to kind of force some results and it still, it, it didn't make any difference. So uh, ignore all the, the squirrely tags and, and, um, and things that kind of look like, like JSON, it's, it's not important. You could actually just say subject equals loop one subject, description equals loop one description. Um, and so if we do debug this, we can just kind of uh, walk through it and see what it says. Uh, it, it wants me to save, even though I didn't make any changes, hang on. And I find Lauren and run this. This is how it works. We got our records. It did find an account ID. This is the account ID. And it, it found cases where the status does not equal closed. So we found that successfully, which means that we are going down the cases found path in our decision. So the first time it goes through the loop, it takes this detail that it found, the subject and description and the status, and it puts it into the prompt. And so it keeps doing that for every single case. And I'll just show you the last case here, down here at the last assignment. And this is the result of, this is the prompt now. Um, so every time it's gone through, it just keeps adding text to it. And that's literally all it's doing is it's building a text output and that text output then gets thrown back into your prompt. And that's what it uses to generate the content. So let's take a look at generated content once it's done here. When I hit preview, it's actually going to do two things. It's going to go ahead and, and do this prompt review, which gives you the resolution. It's telling you exactly how it followed the instructions. This is the part, you know, it found my, my title and my user record. It found my name, it found my hire date um, and who we're talking to and her account. Like that's all the information that it found. And then it, here's how it resolved the other things, which is specifically the cases. So, 
that's how we can verify that we're getting the results that we wanted from all of our resources that we're putting into our prompt. And then it takes all of that resolution, sends it out to the LLM and comes back with a response, which is what we're seeing here. So we have, you know, that introduction, the introduction, this completely made up sentence about what happens during the quarterly business review, and then the eight cases that need need to be resolved. And then the thank you. And it even sent off a best re regards. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this is generative AI, and I have run this, this preview about 50 times. And every time I do this, I get varying results. And that's because it is generative. Sometimes it condenses all this down into a paragraph. Sometimes it's this nicely bulleted list. Sometimes it's six paragraphs. So something called prompt engineering is continuing to work with your prompt to try to get reproduce the same results that you would like. So one of the things that I added just actually this morning was there should always be at least four paragraphs. And that's why we're seeing that now, because sometimes it only has one. And that means it's condensed everything and doesn't make it legible to the recipient. So that's how you have to kind of work with your prompt. Anyone have any questions, chats, or anything about Prompt Builder? I have a question, um, and I may have missed this, but if it's if it continues to learn, is it learning from edits that you make on an email before you were to send it? Or is that too advanced? <laughs> so I, I'll get that to into, into that actually in a little bit is, is that with Salesforce, we insist that our, our large language models, the LLMs are not learning from your content and data. Um, that is part of the, the, what we call the Einstein trust layer and making sure that that the agreements that we have with third parties do not retain and do not train off of that data. So um, cool. go ahead. I was going to say, that's great. Good. Okay. Good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> that's helpful. Anyone else? I just have a question. Like, I think this is a great example. I've seen this several times um with attending different events besides like generating an email what else might you use like a prompt builder template for i think the email case is a really good one but other thoughts on that are you asking me or the group anyone really that can answer well i can answer it in uh, um if I could figure out how to get out of here. I mean, the other thing that right now Prompt Builder is really just emails, but the other is field generation. And I wasn't going to get into a demo of doing that, but if I create a new prompt here, um, I do have an option for field generation. I give mm. it a name, right? And what object do I want to create um, this field for? So if I were looking at the case object, for instance, um, what I what I couldn't figure out though was I created a I was going to demo it and I I created a custom field here on cases called support history and I was going to use that same template um, and it doesn't see my my custom field so I don't know but um, mm. I I could maybe put it into the close summary or something and so it's the same kind of thing except that now you have you can use a <clears throat> you can when you edit the page, you one have to use a dynamic form mm. on your lightning page. And then when you edit it, there's a little button that says create with Einstein. So you can still type it or you can create with Einstein and it will pre-fill the text with what you want. So <clears throat> that's, that's, that's a really cool way too. The unfortunate thing is, is that like, I actually said, like I wanted to create an account description and I, I created a prompt that said, um, tell me everything you know about Omega Inc. And it says, well, I don't have access to search the internet. So it, you, you do have to provide it with something to put in there, I guess, in, in many cases. So. <clears throat> Thanks. There, there will be other places where you start to see prompts being created or where you'll want to see prompts be created um, coming up, but uh, we'll see where that comes up.
Any other questions? So I think you can see how we solved our user story with generative AI much quicker than doing it manually. And now we can talk about those challenges with, that we have with AI. So there are a lot of challenges with it. We call it the trust gap. And it's things like privacy, who owns that data? I'm sorry, not who owns it. Privacy is who can see the data. Hallucinations when things get made up. Data control is who owns the data. And then bias and toxicity being put back into that content that gets created. So to give you an example of some of that, first time I used, uh, maybe not the first time, but one of the first times I used ChatGPT, it hallucinated for me. It, I asked it how to configure something in Salesforce, and it gave me very explicit instructions. It said, go to setup, go to this menu item, or find this menu item, click on this, slide this slider, type this thing in. And the great thing about that was like, wow, I don't have to think about this at all except that none of those menu items actually existed. That's that generative thing. It didn't know, so it made it up. None of those menus had actually ever existed. And while I can go read a help article to actually figure out how to configure what I wanted to, sometimes people use AI to create hallucinations on purpose. There was a giant scandal in Australia where the big four consulting firms, not to name them, were implicated based off of content that was created using AI. It wrapped them up in scandals, talked about people that were doing things incorrectly, and none of those people even worked for the big four consulting firms. And those scandals had nothing to do with the big four consulting firms, but it caused a major impact for all of them. Similarly, there was a judge in the UK who decided to use ChatGPT to write a legal brief, which might affect hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. The only problem with it is that it was full of errors that were of things that were made up and this suddenly could have been become law if it had not been caught. So it's really important to make sure that there is someone in the loop in all of this. When we talk about like bias and toxicity, we know as a fact that like facial recognition or well, I should say when anyone's writing a logarithms, there's the potential to introduce bias. And for a long time, there's been a racial bias in facial recognition. Super great at recognizing extreme details in white faces, but non-white faces, not as good. Why? Because the logarithms weren't trained pro appropriately across a racial spectrum. And that's caused a lot of legal problems as well. At Salesforce, we try to overcome this gap. And to do that, we've built AI principles. We, we stand behind these principles um, whenever we are creating AI products. And whether or not you're going to use Salesforce's AI tools or you're going to use another tech company's AI tools because everyone's got them. I've seen commercials on TV from IBM telling you to use Watson X to write your code. I mean, how obscure is that, that they thought it was the right thing, like a commercial to put on during the NFL game last night? I mean, how many coders are out there going, yeah, now I'm gonna use IBM. Um, but also Office, Microsoft Office has their co-pilot technology. But do you know if the data that you're writing or is in your company's accounting spreadsheet is being sent to Microsoft and what's happening with it? Those are important questions to ask before you allow these tools to, to, have, to work. We, do, we solve this through what we call that trust layer. And this is gonna start answering some of that questions. When we're going to generate something, we're going to grab the data that you've specified from sales cloud, service cloud, et cetera. We're going to get that data. We're going to ground it dynamically, which means that, that we are, are applying some context to it based off of what we know. We'll mask that data and then defend the prompt itself. What does that mean? If, if I'm pulling forward this part, this information about Stefan and Samantha Jones, when I mask, when I ground it, I'm saying, do not address any content or generate any answers that you don't have any data on. Then I mask it. Here's that I'm person zero, person one, address zero. And then, hey, the defense of this prompt is if you don't know, if you're unsure, just say so. Don't, again, don't make things up. That's all part of that dynamic grounding so that we're not introducing errors into what comes back. We then send it over to the LLMs, your data, <clears throat> through what we call the secure gateway, where we have zero retention. And there are three different models that you can use 
for LLMs. Salesforce itself has a couple of AI models inside our Salesforce trust boundary, and there'll be more that are coming as well. We also will support bring your own models on your own infrastructure. So if you're using like SageMaker, Amazon SageMaker to already use AI in other places, you can continue to use that model with your Salesforce data. And then we as Salesforce too have negotiated with AI companies to use their external models at all. And we, we build in tr a shared trust boundary with them, which means basically we have contracts in place that say, hey, you can't retain this data, you can't train off of this data and we're gonna audit what you do. So the first partner that we went to market with is OpenAI and ChatGPT, but there's also others that we're bringing into that model as well. So that's the secure part of it. And then when it all comes back, we have to, to get you the, the response, right? So we do a toxicity detection, make sure that it's okay. We demass that data, go from variables back to real people. We then provide this feedback and audit trail process so that if it's not good, if it doesn't come back right, we can provide and train the, the, the AI models better. Prompt Builder's cool. Like Jen said, hey, uh, um, I like making emails, but what else, what else is coming? Um, so this is what else is coming. We too have our own co-pilot technology in the works. Um, it's supposed to go into pilot February 24. By the way, any of these pilots you want to participate in, talk to your AE to get involved with it. Um, but Copilot is going to be like that, that chat conversation assistant right on the right. It's not really on the right-hand side of your screen. It's actually a minimizable tab that will be on your screen and available to you and your users. And it's supposed to allow you to ask, ask questions in you know natural ways. Like, what was the last record I updated? Well, here it is. It's Vandalay Industries. Um, or I need a description for this account. Create one for me. And that's where that, it actually might use another prompt um, if you're seeing that right here. So the great thing about this is that it's two things is that it's going to be used uh, that, that to create co-pilots, there'll be a bunch of these Einstein actions that you can put together to create how you want co-pilot to work. Um, so you can enable which ones you want or turn off ones that you don't want. And I know that third parties are gonna start coming out with these. You'll see them on the app exchange. You'll be able to develop your own. So you'll be able to continue to extend co-pilot to do more and more. As part of Copilot, one of the things that it's doing is it's going to be able to, to allow you to update data, but it's going to govern that through the permissions that you're used to using. So it's going to look at profiles and permission. I'm sorry, not profiles, just permission sets um, to know how to um, whether or not someone can update a contact or or you know edit a record. So it's going to use all that same platform security that you're used to. Um, by the way, if you didn't catch that, is that you should be making sure that all your security is in permission sets and not profiles, even though that was delayed, but still be working on that. All right. Should you have an AI strategy? Um, this is my, my thought, kind of Salesforce's thought, is that AI is a tool. And you usually don't say, I have a tool strategy. Um, you probably haven't gotten together as a Salesforce admin team and said, you know what, let's come up with our approval process strategy or our custom object strategy or our Einstein strategy. Um, so to us, we think that AI certainly has the ability to create new and great way things to do that. I know, Brian, you have a custom object strategy, <laughs> but it should be built into the flow of work, the things that you do every day. And instead of saying, I want to use generative AI to solve a problem, it should be what problems need solving and what are the tools that I can put into them to solve it? So, I mean, we have a problem where, where a support rep needs to generate an email and it takes them a bunch of time to do that. What tools can I use to do that? Well, I can use one, I'm going to use email, I can use... The, the prompt builder, but I'm also using flow, right? It wasn't just, hey, let's just generate, use generative AI. It was what tools get us to the end goal. And I might actually think about building some other automation in there about quarterly reminders uh, for the, the support person, creating tasks and et cetera, right? So there's all kinds of tools that we'll use to accomplish that goal. 
So the big thing is just make sure that, that you're thinking about it holistically. So for those of you that aren't using it or not using it here in ChatGPT, it disagrees. <laughs> Actually, I did ask ChatGPT that too, Jen, and saw that it disagrees, but you know, it's probably a little biased. If you haven't started using AI at all, these are the things that you need to start doing as an organization to be ready, because you're going to need to, to put these in, in place at some point to help drive efficiencies. The very first is thinking about data cleanup and optimization. If you have a bunch of cases that nobody has ever closed out, um, and they've just expired because you know they're two years old. Um, how are you going to train your AI on that? Because it's going to think that those cases literally take two years to close. Um, if you have cases that there isn't a resolution in there, how will it know how to solve these problems? If you have data in Word files or Excel files, it's going to be really hard to train your AI on that too. So centralizing your data. Now, if you do have other data systems like an SAP system or some other kind of ERP system or a data warehouse system. The great news is, is that data cloud together with Einstein AI creates a really compelling use case. But I'm not gonna talk about data cloud, but data cloud can bring in external systems into you know, your Salesforce org so that, that you can run AI on all of it. The other thing to think about besides your data cleanup is process and knowledge documentation. If you have Salesforce knowledge, making sure that, that standard processes are documented is gonna help train that AI as well. And the last piece of getting ready is determining your policy and guidance. And that maybe isn't something for you as Salesforce admins, but it's worth talking about with your executives, your IT leaders is what is our guidance here? What are employees being told they can use, uh, how they can use AI? Salesforce here, I'm allowed to use AI to brainstorm about this, um, this presentation, but I was not allowed to put customer data into that AI to generate a case summary, as an example, if I were to just go to chat GPT. So is there some, some policy and guidance that your organization has provided? Because guaranteed somebody is doing it. You all, most of you said you're using it. I guarantee you someone is putting customer data into chat GPT that probably shouldn't be there. So if you're ready to learn more, this is a really great, <laughs> great trail to get started with. Get started with AI. Um, go ahead and copy the link or scan the code. Um, it's This is all about AI. It's uh, None of it is hands-on like learning. It's, it's more about the concepts and the reasons why and how and, and all that. So uh, happy to take questions. Thanks, Andy. There is a question in the chat um, from Pearl. Can you please talk a little bit about the Einstein One platform versus the Salesforce platform? Sure. <clears throat> Einstein One platform is really the set of tools combined with that that we are continuing to release, um, like Einstein GPT, the the Copilot, um, and all the other tools combined together with that, that Einstein trust layer. Um, some of the other tools, just like Code Builder, if, if you haven't seen Einstein in Code Builder, um, where you can ask it to write a, a class for you and it will pretty pretty well write a class. Um, that That's like that's something else that's, I think, in pilot at the moment. So um, it's really just that set of tools Whereas, you know, the Salesforce platform is, is that core piece of, of Salesforce, you know, service cloud, well, core platform is accounts, contacts, um, service cloud with cases, sales cloud with opportunities kind of thing. Is this being recorded? It's just marketing mumbo jumbo. It is being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Andy? I'll just Andy. throw out there. Oh, go ahead, Brian. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, after of nothing, that uh, I found the trail content to be really good and support everything you just said. Do you have any, any contrary opinions or additional ads you'd give to that? I don't, other than the content is growing rapidly i i 
just you know we get a daily employee email just today they said that oh they're guess what on the heels of chicago world tour new york world tour this week there's eight more trails that or eight more modules that have come out with ai so i don't know what's in them there actually might be some some hands-on stuff by now um so they they are very good very good so andy are you are you and what and how are you using AI as part of your everyday job function? Um, so there, there are some some cases where I'm using it. I don't use it probably every day. Um, we actually did just that. I haven't enabled it yet. I should should have looked at it before this. Uh, like a week ago, we were told um, because we are all now on Spring 24 here at Salesforce. Um, we were told, hey, guess what? Copilot's available to you. Go ahead and set it up. So I should have done that so I could talk a little bit more smartly about it. But one of the things as a solution engineer, you know, that we do is we create a lot of custom demos specifically to our customer use cases. And so while I'm not using Salesforce's AI, where I can use ChatGPT to like jumpstart a lot of what we do is setting up demo scenarios. I can use it to explain what I want to do, have it write me a demo script, um, a step-by-step -step demo script, and then even generate fake data. And the great thing about that is, is you know, a lot of times, like I, I like to use re like real addresses that will resolve somewhere. I don't really want you know, like Brian, I don't want your specifically address, but I do want an address that is real that, you know, where the city state and where the street city state and country actually line up. So there's tools like Makaroo that will will create fake data, but none of that stuff actually lines up that it's real. And so that makes it really hard to do things like show it on maps. So it, it will generate fake data for me or and it'll generate case data um, related to the subject. I don't have to think about a dozen different, you know, I deal a lot with government. So like if I need a, a thousand cases related to someone's Medicare benefits, it can go ahead and create a thousand cases, you know, with all of the content, export it out into a spreadsheet and, and upload it. Thanks, Lynette. <clears throat> I too. Oh, that. Yeah. Go ahead. Yep. We're, we're at the top of the hour. We uh, kept it short and sweet today. Andy, thank you so much for coming and, uh, talking to us more about AI. As I said in the chat, this is one of the best prompt builder demos I have seen. Um, so thanks for giving us that use case and showing this off. Well, you're welcome. I hope you all learned something today and uh, look forward to seeing you all at a Salesforce Saturday someday. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.